Watch this. There's a problem here. And the problem is much bigger, and I don't know that um, it will be rectified anytime soon. Philip Thompson is the executive director of Idaho's Black History Museum. He's also the son of community activist and former state senator Cherie Buckner Webb. Their family has been in Boise for seven generations, a place with a population that is only about one and a half percent black. In wanting to get some local perspective on the George Floyd protests happening across the country, we thought Phillips would be some pretty good eyes through which to view it. We sat down with Philip outside the museum and asked his thoughts on Minneapolis and Idaho. To me, it's kind of like the, um, the pressure cooker has blown up and we've been kind of headed towards this for quite some time. And Minnesota is unique because it's kind of a case study. The reaction to those who are protesting the lockdown in comparison to the reaction to those who are protesting police brutality, the answer was more brutality. That's, that speaks volumes about the treatment of um, blacks in America. With the officer being arrested today, hmm. is that enough or at least a start? No, I don't think it is at all because I mean, this is indicative of a much, much bigger systemic problem. This is what we're dealing with on the, on the daily. These are simply um, captured moments of that transpiring. It's not that we're seeing a vast increase, we're simply seeing an increase of it being captured on film. So then what do you think about local law enforcement who have since spoken out and condemned what happened in Minneapolis? I think Boise, Idaho is a unique, um, beautiful place, first and foremost. But our history is um, also unique, a unique case study because you look 30, 40 years ago, like in the 90s, probably 30 years ago, in the early 90s, we had our issues with policing, but it wasn't predicated on race because there's always been such a small black population here. But we had poor policing methods in place in Boise, Idaho from the 90s to now, it's nowhere near what it used to be, right? I mean, our police force is rather community-centric, mm -hmm. um, talk first, not strike first. Um, I have nothing negative to say about our police force as it stands in the last like five, 10 years, but I believe they are unique and they are the exception to the rule. I'm not vilifying all police. I'm simply saying that our police department has made a concerted effort to be ahead of the curve and to make for certain they address these problems before they stem, before they um, blossom, and try to get to the root of the problem. Okay, so on a personal note, I spoke with your mom before she retired, mm -hmm. recently retired, and she talked about growing up here and talked about a cross burning outside of her home as a little girl. 19. What's it like for a young black man to grow up in Idaho? The first thing I remember my mom was telling us is you have to be twice as good because you're half as good. Uh, my mom never let it go unspoken that you will not be judged the same way as those with you if you are the only black one. Expect it, um, deal with it, and just navigate the road accordingly. Um, don't allow them to hold you back, to hold you down, but know that this is not an equal playing field. It's not set up for you to thrive. So what do you say then to people who say, well, hey, I've never seen that. I've never, that's not true. I've never seen anybody treated differently. And that's, that's, a, that's a luxury that some people have. I mean, I've never seen a lot of things, but I'm not going to question its existence. I've never seen nuclear fission, but I know it works. These acts of violence, at least we no longer have to convince you that they're happening because these beautiful smartphones capture them time and time again. Any rational human knows that it's not just all of a sudden this is happening. Simply, we're just all of a sudden able to capture it and you can't refute the evidence. Philip concedes even his experience as a black man in Idaho may differ from others. He grew up with access and connections not everyone had. Philip also serves on the city's police chief advisory panel, and he told me in his or he is in frequent contact with BPD, has been through several chiefs of police about how they can better handle community relations. He says the department's transparency and training has been key to its improvement over the last couple of decades. But these issues that we're seeing play out across the country with injustice, inequality, brutality. It's not a question of if we will see it happen in Idaho or to what level. The question is, how will we handle it when it does? So speaking of this, he had a full grown man kneeling on his neck for more than eight minutes, longer than it likely takes you to take a shower. George Floyd stopped moving well before that, but not before telling officers at least a dozen times, I can't breathe. 
About an hour later, he was pronounced dead at the hospital. That was Monday night in Minneapolis. Today, the former police officer who did that to George Floyd, Derek Chauvin, was arrested and charged with third degree murder. But for three nights, the residents of Minneapolis reacted with protests that eventually turned violent. Several buildings have been destroyed, including a police precinct. And as soon as that video was put out there, people started reacting to it, condemning what they saw, including right here in the Treasure Valley. Former Eagle Chief of Police Patrick Cowley posted on his personal Facebook page that what happened to George Floyd is a crime that even 33 years of combined military and police service couldn't prepare, prepare me to witness by video. I watched it with horror and shock. I will pray that the looters and rioters stop desecrating the man protested. Yes, be the change, adding that he will waive any fees to testify for the prosecution if needed. He has experience in court with such things. Deputy Chief of Police for the City of Meridian, Tracy Bastarachea, by the way, also posting on Facebook saying, quote, the absolute disregard for a human life is obvious in the officer's actions and lack of action. There's no police training I have been involved with in my 24 years where it has ever been taught to kneel on somebody's neck. In fact, it is stressed not to do this. And that's also something you at home asked us about. Mary Taylor sent us this question. Given so many cases of unarmed black people being killed by police across our country, I'd like to know if the Boise and Meridian Police Departments employ evidence-based police de-escalation trainings. So we went to Deputy Chief Pastor Achea. He teaches classes to officers in training. We're having some technical difficulties getting that story to you. We're going to bring it to you tonight on the News at 10. But the answer in short is yes, they do have training for de-escalation and implicit bias, bias training. All of this taught from the post training out at Meridian, the post police academy, all the way through concurrent training as they continue their career. Again, we're going to have more on this coming up tonight on the News at 10. Put away your pressed jeans and keep your cowboy hats in the closet because you probably won't need them this summer. Well, at least in Nampa. The latest COVID casualty ends a 105 year Treasure Valley tradition. Solitude on suspended scaffolding. This Portland artist is brightening up the Boise skyline one bucket of paint at a time. What's brightening your day? Or maybe there's something else on your mind you want to talk about. We listen to everything. Text us 208 321 5614. Include your name and the hashtag the 208. We might read yours coming up at the end of the show.
The local rodeo scene started to fall away this spring, the beginning of this month, with Riggins canceling its annual two day tradition after 71 straight years. But the Snake River Stampede, part of the Canyon County culture for more than a century, that's not until August, so surely they could keep going this year. Nope. After 105 years, no bareback bronc riding, no barrel racing, and yes, no mutton busting this summer at the Fort Idaho Center. Organizers making the announcement just minutes ago that the wildest, fastest show on earth, the Idaho Stampede, will not happen this year. Gretchen Parsons spoke with the president of the rodeo this afternoon about the decision to call off what is usually one of the highlights of the summer here in the Treasure Valley. Gretchen? Yeah, Brian, since 1915, the Snake River Stampede has grown to become one of the top 10 professional rodeos in the nation, bringing the best cowboys and cowgirls to Nampa every July. Board members say they've been working to come up with a solution to keep competitors, fans and the community safe amid the pandemic. But unfortunately, President Roger Todd says that's something they just couldn't find a way to do. Todd says they were working with a tight deadline. They considered pushing the event back, but still trying to adhere to health guidelines in a way that still fiscally makes sense for the rodeo. It just wasn't possible. So Todd says he and board members came to the hard decision last night that the Stampede River won't happen this year. It's a huge loss to the community. Um, all the cowboys that come in, spend money in our town, all the hotels. Uh, we are uh, the primary fundraising event for a lot of our uh, uh, volunteers and civic group. It's going to be a huge financial loss for for Nampa as a whole. And as far as next year goes, it's possible we could still be dealing with COVID-19. And if that is the case, Todd says the board will have enough time to prepare to put a plan in place so the Snake River Stampede can go on. Either way, he says next year has to be bigger and better than ever to make up for this year. It's a lot to make up. Yeah, that's that's true. All right, thanks, Gretchen. Well, what about the other rodeo events in the valley, like the best small town throwdown around the Eagle Rodeo? That usually takes place in early June, and that has been rescheduled to early September. Then there's the place where the Cowboys are the stars, the Caldwell Night Rodeo. It's another August event, and they haven't made a decision yet. I spoke with Gene Betts, the director, this afternoon. He said they have a drop-dead date of July 6th, and they are monitoring the situation daily, and they should have a decision for the Rowdies and the Sibbies on or before that day. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. We're going to get to some of your thoughts and questions coming up at the end of the show. But if you'd like to share yours with us, you can do that right now. The text line is open. Grab your phones and send us something. 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag the 208. Again, we're going to read some of the good ones coming up on the end of the show.
All right, if you've been into downtown Boise recently, you may have noticed something's different. I mean, other than the prime parking spots now dedicated to curbside delivery, there's a little painting project taking place on one of the city's biggest buildings. We stopped by to check out the progress and see what inspired this mural of serious magnitude. Consider this your feel good Friday or actually more of a feel queasy Friday if you have an issue with heights. Downtown Boise is not necessarily wanting when it comes to works of art. Oh, they, they do pretty good. <laughs> An empty wall will inevitably, effectively get filled. There's some good stuff, yeah. And often with a freakish flair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the latest concrete canvas belongs to the Key Bank building, and it's being covered by Portland artist David Carmack Lewis, who is used to working in Boise, but only this is if it's big. This is not just big, this is huge. It may be the 10th tallest tower in town, but it marks another first for David. When I did the water cooler mural, that was the biggest thing I'd ever done. Then I did the Fowler mural, and that was the biggest thing I've ever done. And now this is the biggest thing I've ever done, so. <laughs> it's 6,500 square feet spread out across about two dozen panels of whitewashed brick. His painting this time provoked by his last time in Idaho, when he saw the Payette River. It's not a specific section of the river, but that was kind of the inspiration. I'm not really interested in just painting landscapes just for the sake of landscapes. I want there to be some other element that intrigues the viewer. That element, for David, tends to be inserting something that hints at humanity without actually putting in people. And it's a way of allowing the viewer to kind of insert themselves in the scene. It's just there's a person there and anyone who looks at it could imagine being in that scene. So my work has always been kind of about describing these isolated moments uh, that to me are, are like just a profoundly powerful, you know, <laughs> spaces for myself. Isolation is a fitting motif considering the moment, but that's not always a bad thing in David's mind. It can feel isolating if it's forced, but, but sometimes we seek it out, you know, and it's a more of a space of hope and wonder. David's space for the past few weeks has been suspended in this scaffold in solitude for seven hours a day. And fortunately, heights, for him, not really a hindrance. I kind of like it, you know, it's like, it almost feels like you're like up in the crow's nest of a ship, you know? <laughs> a lookout that could make listening to the sounds of the city sort of distracting. Not for David. Sometimes just doing the work, it's just I, I'm focused and I, you know, my mind is just clear of thoughts and it's, it's kind of refreshing that way. You know, I enjoy the process, so it's almost like a meditation, just, just working. For some artists, putting your work out there for people to see is scarier than hanging off the side of a building. But when one's art is this hard to hide, one can only hope. Yeah, I hope they enjoy it. <laughs> I do it for me. I mean, I do something that I like and, and I can only hope that, you know, others enjoy it too. And for the most part, people seem to, so. So to finish, he's given himself six weeks and who knows how many gallons of paint. I'm not sure because the scale is just, you know, bigger than anything I've, I've done before. So we'll see. And we'll see what he sees when he's done. There's a point where if I'm just fiddling with it, it's done. But if it looks like it's done, then it's done. For David, it's not go big or go home. It's go big and then then go home to Portland. So when he is done, will we see him back here again working on an even bigger canvas? He says likely no. He's going to start scaling it back a bit for the time being. But who knows? You know that U.S. Bank building downtown? It could use some color.
I'm going to bet you don't have a pair of these in your closet. Check this out. Treasure Valley Vans. Yeah, look at those. Dan Anderson, the head of the art department at both Valley View and Ridgeview High School, says students at Valley View designed two pairs of Vans shoes, including one with the theme of local flavor. Anderson says his students, about 10 of them, were inspired by what our culture in the Treasure Valley looks like. As you can see there, it's obvious with the balloons, right? Specifically, he says the student was inspired by the night glow, which happens every August during the Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic. You can see they incorporate that into the topography of the surrounding valley. Meanwhile, Valley View is placed in the top 50 five times during this contest. And this year, they made it all the way to number two. Congratulations. And with that win, they get a $10,000 check. Wow, which Anderson says they're going to use to help students buy art supplies and start art clubs, among other things. And for the first time, Ridgeview cracking the top 25 with their design that's centered around Idaho's state flower, the Syringa. Check that out. Look at the butterfly. Yep, as well as Idaho State Butterfly, the Monarch. And you thought the throwback checkerboard vans that you thought were cool? Yeah, not as cool as these. Well, be ready for the changes this weekend, and you won't even have to leave town or travel 500 miles to see it. It's going to happen right here. That means that temperatures will be changing up to close to 100 degrees. Could be 100 in many spots tomorrow, dropping down to about 80 degrees on Sunday. First, let's start and talk about the sunny afternoon, and the winds are nice and light. This is beautiful for this afternoon as we go outside here, so that's Skycam 7. Let's move ahead, and I'll show you the high temperatures that we've had so far. Uh, the high in Boise, 94 degrees. That's the warmest so far, 95 in Ontario. In fact, this is the warmest day that we've had so far for this year. And you see 92 degrees was the high in Twin Falls. Haley had 88, so they were pretty close to 90 degrees. And these temperatures could still go up another degree or two. One thing to keep in mind for tomorrow, not only is it just going to be hot, but here are your wind gusts. It's going to be a little breezy in the morning, but it really gets going about noon, 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So in Boise, 40 mile an hour wind gusts. In the mountains, 30 mile an hour wind gusts and uh, then 50 mile an hour wind gusts in eastern Oregon, even over the Owyhees. So the remainder of tonight, so you've got 96 degrees there at 6 o'clock. 10 o'clock tonight, it's 82. You see overnight, you don't have to worry about those gardens. Temperatures will be dropping into the mid-60s by tomorrow morning. Then tomorrow afternoon, it shows the 98, but some spots, uh, Emmett, Weezer, Ontario, uh, could be 100 degrees. Same thing for Mountain Home. Uh, when I look at the map here for... Uh, Riggins. Riggins could possibly be up to 101 for tomorrow. So we're talking about some hot temperatures there as well. So these temperatures are going to continue to warm up. Now, as far as windy weather happens to, or is concerned, uh, you can see the brown area there will be the strongest gusts in eastern Oregon and down over the Owyhees. And uh, this means that some of the gusts could be as much as 50 miles an hour. So it could be pretty strong. And that's south of town. Uh, but along the freeway, expect some of the winds likely around 40 miles an hour. And here's what it looks like in the valley. As you see, winds gusting to about 38 miles an hour, so we could be seeing some peak wind gusts up to 40 miles an hour. So there's the 98 to about 100 for tomorrow. Sunday is 80, 82 for Monday, 83 degrees for Tuesday. It starts warming a little, but you know, the end of next week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, storm system comes in. This is the weekend with sunshine. Next weekend could be a weekend that has some rain showers and especially rain coming down in the mountains. That's it for the weather. We're going to be back with more in just a moment.
kind of a divisive week across the country when it comes to race relations, especially when we take a look at how the police have been handling things and residents reaction to that. We're seeing protests pop up all over the country because of the death of George Floyd. Now let's take a look at some of the comments that you sent in during today's show. This one from Sandy Watkins in 1998. I was pulled over for speeding here in Boise. My black passenger friend was asked to get out of the car and was frisked. That has never happened to a white passenger in my life. Yeah, as we talked to uh, Philip Thompson, things have certainly changed here in the Boise area with the way the police and the community, the relationship with each other. There's been a lot of training and a lot of perspective that has ha that has to do with that. People learning about each other and learning how to deal with certain situations. It's not perfect by any stretch, but again, it's getting better. Nice job, Channel 7, for having an interview that helps perpetuate the problem and continues to portray Minneapolis as an issue of race rather than right or wrong. Would be so nice if the media could help solve rather than add to the division in this country. Wouldn't have been hearing anything about this if the colors of the people involved were reversed. This sent in from Annie and Annie. So much to unpack here. Let's talk about this perpetuating the problem. Since when is offering somebody else's perspective on a situation that you may not be familiar with? How is that perpetuating a problem? It's simply offering that up so maybe you can learn something about somebody's perspective and learn what is what it's like for them to see the world through their eyes. Would be nice if the media could help solve rather than add to the division an issue of race rather than and no one said this isn't an issue of right and wrong. This is it's 100 percent wrong at any angle, any of those camera angles, no matter who is involved. That's not the question. Sadly, the percentage of those involved and on the wrong side of this just happen to be black across this country. Look at the statistics. You can't argue with that. We could go on for days about that, Annie. Let's move on from this. Thanks for the great interview with Philip. Uh, that's Philip Thompson. This conflicted and difficult time needs to be needs those educated and realistic voices to keep us in touch with events around us and on a path forward. Thank you, Jan, for sending that in. We'll see you next week.